Hello everyone. The topic for today is venous thromboembolism, which covers the topics of both DVT as well as pulmonary embolism. Generally, pulmonary embolism is a result of the clot dislodging from the deep vein thrombosis and getting subsequently entrapped within the pulmonary circulation, which is referred to as thrombotic pulmonary embolism. Also, pulmonary embolism can arise due to various non-thrombotic etiologies, which includes air embolism, fat embolism, bone marrow embolism or say amniotic fluid embolism which are less common etiologies but also should be remembered. You should remember that uh, venous thromboembolism in the components of both DVT and PE has a shared pathogenesis in the form of stasis, hypercoagulability along with endothelial injury and inflammation. This is referred to as Virchow's triad. Uh, this includes disorders that can be inherited in the form of uh, say vector 5 lead and prothrombin mutations or protein C, S or antithrombin D deficiency. Along with that you can have various inherited conditions like anti phospholipid antibody syndrome, pregnancy, use of OCPs or post-monopausal hormone replacement therapy or if erythropoiesis stimulating agents are being administered. You should also note that various chronic diseases like cancer, acute stroke, MIC, KD, pneumonia, sepsis along with RAIBD and psoriasis and also cigarette smoking are important in this regard. You should also remember that long haul air travel, uh, long term paralysis, bedridden state and recent hospitalization all increase the risk for pulmonary embolism. You should note that pulmonary th venous thromboembolism uh, as a disease although it's highly treatable it still reduces the quality of life post the disease occurrence and uh, dvt is subsequently associated with post dvt syndrome also referred to as chronic venous insufficiency where the venous valves are destroyed whereas in the condition of pulmonary embolism we generally have the post pe syndrome which is manifested by exertional dyspnea along with that group 4 who group 4 i'm sorry uh, along with that who group 4 variety of uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension referred to as CTEPH, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension might develop in the patient. The patient may also have persistent right ventricular dysfunction in the form of right ventricle failure. You should remember that DVT is divided into two basic categories, lower extremity or upper extremity. Upper extremity is DVT is far less common, is generally seen due to placement of uh, pacemakers, internal cardiac defibrillators or indwelling CVCs. Uh, along with that, you should note that the catheter diameter and the number of lumens will increase the risk of DVT. That is why it is now proposed that use a four friends catheter. Also with that, it is proposed that you should use a single lumen central venous catheter. Uh, lower extremity DVT, just remember that it is most common in the calf but uh, in the calf but uh, it can also occurring uh, be occurring proximally and this will increase the risk for pe uh, more than that of the calf dvt along with that superficial venous thrombosis is unrelated to dvt it is generally going to present as a palpable cord along with erythema and tenderness in the patient it will increase the risk of subsequent deep vein thrombosis pulmonary embolism as a disorder remember it generally arises due to uh, the perfusion being blocked that is passing through the alveoli which are normally ventilated and this PLO2 is normal but because the perfusion will decrease the gas exchange cannot occur the PAO2 will subsequently fall and this gives rise to increase in alveolar to arterial gradient and subsequently the physiologic dead space will increase and hypoxemia will result all of this is summarized in this along with that you should know that PE generally has the most common symptom of dyspnea and the most common sign is tachypnea or tachycardia. Other symptoms and signs may include hemoptysis and pleural effusion, specifically if the disease is peripheral in nature. You should note that this disorder PE is referred to as a great masquerader because variety of signs and symptoms might develop in the patient and these are generally non-specific in nature. Uh, all of this will culminate in causing hypoxemia and thus gives rise to pulmonary arterial vasoconstriction, thus increasing pulmonary vascular resistance. This will lead to pulmonary uh, right ventricular pressure overload, increasing the right ventricular strain and that will give rise to right ventricular ischemia or infarction which can be demonstrated using a plasma cardiac proponents or a heart type FABP level increase. Along with that, dilatation and dysfunction can occur which can be visualized through trans thoracic echocardiography which is uh, which which will identify uh, hypokinetic right ventricular free wall whereas a hyperkinetic right ventricular apex referred to as mechanical sign along with that you might see uh, the increase in bnp and anti pro bnp levels and ecg might demonstrate s1 q3 q3 t3 sign along with that t wave inversion in the b1 to b4 leads will be seen all of this culminates in decreasing the left ventricle preload if the obstruction is severe enough and that will cause a decrease in cardiac output and subsequently gives rise to obstructive shock in the patient. You should note that DVT-PEV 
DVT and PE, these are highly preventable diseases and thus every effort must be made to prevent this disorder by administration of either unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin or fondaparinux which is a type of ultra low molecular weight heparin in these patients. These are the doses and this is how it is administered. The duration is generally till the hospitalization is there in the patient but for some patients it is generally said that uh, prophylaxis should continue and thus for this the agent rivaroxaban which is an anti 10 a agent has been approved. Along with that you should note that if anti anticoagulation is contraindicated in the patient in that condition you should go with intermittent pneumatic compression the approach to vte generally includes first calculating the likelihood of this disorder through the wells point score along with that this will guide us to which invest initial investigation we should use in the patient and finally uh, when the diagnosis is secure you should be able to initiate treatment in this patient so uh, that clinical risk score for dvt is uh, having a point score of one for all the elements except for when alternative diagnosis is at least as likely uh, as dvt when the score is minus two the score is defined as low risk when the score is less than or equal to 0 and for this the initial investigation the screening investigation is using D dimer if the value is normal then DVT can be safely excluded or ruled out whereas when the disease is high or when the likelihood of the disorder is not low you should go proceed with the investigation of choice which is the venous ultrasound if the diagnosis is not secure use other advanced in imaging techniques like MR venography with gadolinium contrast or contrast flabography or say CT scan uh, which can help uh, secure your diagnosis of DVT. Remember, for the case of PE, the score is more important. There is a mnemonic hip sake, which will help you remember the various etiologies. Remember, the various components are heart rate more than 100 per minute, immobilization more than 3 days or surgery within 4 weeks, and prior DVT and PE, all attributed with a score of 1.5. Along with that, you can have alternative diagnosis, which should be less likely, in which condition the score is three and when edema is present that is when the score is three or when hemoptysis or cancer will be present where the score is one remember high risk score is where the the score exceeds more than four in which you should proceed first with imaging not with a screening investigation like d dimer elisa but when the score is not high that is the score is less than equal is less than four in that condition you should go with a d dimer assay and if the disease if this comes out to be normal then pe can be safely excluded whereas when it is high you should proceed with imaging study the investigation of choices ct pulmonary angiography but uh, if the di diagnosis is not secure proceed with second line investigation lung scan or uh, venous ultrasound subsequently and advanced imaging techniques are the imaging techniques of last resort which includes trans esophageal echocardiography or contrast enhanced MRI which can visualize only massive varieties of pulmonary embolism or you can go with invasive pulmonary angiography. Some limited description of all of these investigation techniques are important and I have summarized them over here. Just note that uh, in D-dimer ELISA, the value for age less than 50 years, the standard is, the upper normal limit is 500 nanogram per ml, whereas for 50 years or more, calculated by multiplying the age with 10, so if a 70 year old man comes to you, then the upper limit will be 700 nanogram per ml and if the value exceeds that, it means that the test is positive. This test has very high sensitivity and we know that when the sensitivity is high, then the false negative rate is less meaning that if the test comes out to be negative if the test is negative it means it's likely a true negative and thus it is used for ruling out or excluding disease so that is why uh, this disorder has very high sensitivity specifically specifically for pulmonary embolism and thus it's very useful rule out test or excluding test for patients uh, who in whom you suspect pulmonary embolism but this disorder is not uh, having high specificity and thus it should not be used for any hospitalized patients because they may have a variety of disease like cancer pneumonia or mi stroke anything which can cause an increase in d dimer levels uh, you should remember that lung scanning for that matter is accomplished using a perfusion scan and a ventilation scan with the positive test being defined as a two or more segmental perfusion defects along with the normal ventilation perfusion is accomplished perfusion scan is accomplished using iv radio labeled albumin whereas ventilation scan is accomplished using inhaled radio label xenon you should remember that venous ultrasound with doppler can identify features of dvt in which you can either go with the loss of vein compressibility or direct visualization of clot which is hypoechoic in nature generally or a loss of normal respiratory variation which are features which are seen on ultrasound in 
DVT. Along with that, chest X-ray signs, chest X-ray can diagnose only massive variety of pulmonary embolism. These signs are less likely to be seen. Generally, chest X-ray is normal. In that condition, just remember that these are some historical signs, which includes pala sign, which is uh, an enlarged right descending pulmonary artery, western mark sign, which is focal oligemia or focal avascularity that can be seen in the region of pulmonary embolism, whereas Hampton sum, which is nothing but a peripheral wedge shape in fact. Apart from this, look at the paragraph on invasive diagnostic modalities. You should remember that invasive pulmonary angiography and contrast fibrography are currently used only when catheter directed thrombolysis and interventional procedures are planned. You should remember that the diagnosis in pulmonary angiography is made when there is a visualization of interluminal filling defect in more than one projection, but secondary signs are also important. Go through them once. Apart from this, remember that patients in pulmonary embolism, they are generally stratified on the basis of their right ventricle function and their left ventricle function. So, if when right ventricle function is deranged, either the, there is right and ventricular enlargement or chest CT or there is an elevation of the troponin level due to right ventricular myocardial infarction or right ventricle dysfunction that is uh, demonstrated on echocardiography. Apart from this left ventricle function, when it is deranged, the patient will land into hypotension and obstructive shock. So, you should note that this is used for classifying the patients into either a low risk pulmonary embolism which constitutes for more than 65 to 75 percent of the cases where the patient's left ventricle and right ventricle functions are preserved. On the other hand, the patient may also have intermediate risk pulmonary embolism which constitutes for around 10 to 15 percent of the cases where the patient's left ventricle function is normal but right ventricle function is disturbed. Whereas on the other hand, high risk PV also referred to as massive pulmonary embolism is where the left ventricle function is deranged and the patient develops hypotension. For the patient in whom the PV uh, pulmonary embolism is, is of low risk, you should go with anticoagulation alone or with IVC filter uh, placement. Along with that, for the patients who are suffering from massive pulmonary embolism, you should first give a bolus of normal serine 500 ml. Along with that, you can go with administration of norepinephrine or uh, dobutamine uh, as vasopressor and inotropic therapy respectively. Apart from that, you should give anticoagulation and thrombolysis as the primary therapy for the patient or you can also go with surgical or catheter directed embolectomy as the important uh, therapy for this condition. You should remember for the case of intermediate risk P, also referred to as some massive variety of P, the therapy needs to be individualized but according to a recent statement, that is given by the American Heart Association, you should remember that uh, the treatment with thrombolysis or embolectomy should be considered when there is clinical deterioration, lack of improvement or severe physical distress or if the patient has persistent right ventricular strain, there is low cardiac output development, there is low bleeding risk in the patient and the patient has good life expectancy. Let us now understand the various treatment modalities that are available for pulmonary embolism. So initially we have anticoagulation which can be achieved either by a parenteral followed by an oral therapy. This is referred to as a bridge therapy. For parenteral therapy which is generally given for 5 days followed by an oral therapy which could either be warfarin, dabigatran or edoxaban. Remember warfarin, the target PTNI that you should achieve is 2 to 3 and if massive bleeding occurs then IV vitamin K1 uh, fresh frozen plasma or prothrombin complex concentrate can be administered to the patient. Similarly, Parental therapy the, using UFH, LMWH or Fondaparinux initially should attain the target APTT value of 60 to 80 second and the reversal agent is protamine sulfate and if dabigatran and edoxaban these are used for dabigatran the reversal agent is idarosuzumab whereas for edoxaban the reversal agent is andexanet alpha. You should remember that these therapies uh, do not require monitoring, their dose is fixed and uh, thus the and there there is no generally dose monitoring that is necessary for this patient apart from this you can go with complete oral therapies also in which you have the option of going with first a loading dose of the drug followed by a maintenance dose in for which rivaroxaban and apixaban have been approved the reversal agent is andexanet alpha now, the second strategy is placement of the IVC filter. Uh, remember that the only indications for placement of IVC filter are that anticoagulation when it is contraindicated or when there is a recurrent thrombosis despite anticoagulation. You should place retrievable, retrievable filters and not permanent and these filters, they can increase the DVT risk but they generally decrease the PE risk. Along with that, there is a uh, the filter may fail because of collateral development through which will allow clots to pass from this area and uh, move up to the lung. Now thrombolysis or fibrinolysis as it is called, is it is achieved by using 100 mg IV recombinant TPA 
IV infusion continuous given over two hours, or you can also go with ultrasound guided catheter directed thrombolysis, which is having less dose and less low bleeding risk of 24 mg over 12 hours. It is useful. Uh, used up to 14 days after the onset of pulmonary embolism. You should always assess for contraindications before administration to reduce the bleeding risk. The major bleeding risk is of 10% and uh, intracranial hemorrhage risk is of 2 to 3% using this therapy. Embolectomy is obviously of last resort, but uh, current research has shown that has shown that this therapy is also uh, very useful for patients of pulmonary embolism. Apart from this, you should remember that the risk of recurrence in patients is high after the first episode of pulmonary embolism. And uh, for patients who are suffering from like active cancer and uh, antiphospholipid uh, syndrome, you should consider indefinite duration anticoagulation, specifically when there is no identifiable risk factor, a persistent risk factor or a minor transient or a reversible risk factor present in the patient. So that completes our discussion related to this chapter. That's all. Read the book. Thank you.